efficient now as well through Microsoft Teams. We always try and team up in pairs where possible for client work. Um, two heads are always better than one. I believe being a developer, a good developer, is writing good quality code. But being a great consultant, which we are, this is W, is half-half between technical skills and communication. That's what makes us different on the market. That's what gives us our edge, because we're capable of not only doing great work in terms of you know, technical skills, but also bringing value and bringing our insight based on our experience, saying, oh, to solve this problem, I would recommend you going that way or this way. And bringing that value, that strategic value to a client and being able to phrase it, not only having it in your head, but phrasing it to give them options. And we make sure that people are communicating internally with each other in a way that is professional and succinct. And we make sure that that's the way that we communicate with our customers as well. And I want to show you a few ways that make email a more useful. People that want to improve their communication through public speaking can do that through the conferences that we're involved in. They can do it through SSW TV. You might actually not need to go native, guys. We have a lot of videos uh, that kind of help get your face out there to get your name out there. We also have a really good social media presence. We have a great marketing team that takes care of that. We are client facing all the time. There's no way to work at SW and just be behind the desk and not talk to anyone any, you know, every day you have to communicate. So that brings communication as a core skill of what you become. And some people develop it a, a way further, like uh, by you know doing public speaking. We have awesome speakers. Uh, I think you know NDC videos prove that we have awesome uh, you know tech tips and and even conferences given by SSW people. I think we had like six or seven this year, so that's pretty huge. One of the exciting things about working here is we're always on the bleeding edge of technology. We're always trying to reach out to those new projects. What are other people doing? What's the next best thing? I think Adam being a Microsoft Regional Director really gives us a bit of an edge in that regard as well because he usually knows what's in the pipeline before other people do. We've had many younger guys come through SSW and in a few short years, they've become absolutely amazing developers. You can have guys with just a few years of experience and they're building software that's affecting tens of thousands of users with some guidance of the software architects. It just works, like, it's amazing. You build something and you test it that you can enter an order and then all of a sudden you can enter thousands of orders, like, in seconds. It's just incredible. We couldn't do that a few years ago. We have a couple of different ways that we socialise. Um, every lunchtime, we're killing each other in board games, which is always good. It's interesting because those games, you know, are about psychology. Uh, that's very interesting. You learn a lot about people. <laughs> the most exciting thing that we do is obviously our company retreats. We go away for a weekend um, after doing a brainstorming session. On the Friday, we all work together as, as a group and work out you know, problems for the company itself. We always try and keep the activities a little bit different to make it a bit of fun. It's just a, a great weekend all around. The people that come to work here want to be at that level of globally recognised expertise that some of the best guys at SSW are at. And even if you're not at that stage now, I think that a lot of people that come to work here are inspired by that. A lot of clients come to us with maybe a general idea of what they want. And you know, you can use your expertise and past experience to really inform their decisions and make sure that they're developing the best possible product. I really enjoy that part of it. I think that would be very satisfying for anyone who's been working on uh, maintaining an old piece of software or maintaining an old system. If they could come and maybe work on some new Greenfields projects and potentially you know, influence the way that product comes out at the other end. You can come up with cool designs, you can come up with new solutions, you can come up with elegant ways of solving problems that haven't really been done before, and plus you get to build something. And often the projects that we're engaged with, uh, you get to build something that's going to make a difference. People want more stuff automated, they want richer interfaces, they want bot interfaces, the architecture keeps expanding, the knowledge of Azure keeps growing. Like, 
I'm still learning. I'm still trying to get better. I'm still trying to make solutions quicker, more maintainable, cheaper. And you know, there's a long way to go. or we play tennis or we go swimming or we go go-karting and all of a sudden he's just like get out of the way <laughs> Thank you. 
G'day team. Uh, heaps of AI news tonight. We have lots of uh, GPT prompt engineering. We've got BARD release, which is awesome. Uh, we can now secure our code with uh, GitHub push protection. And we have animated backgrounds in Microsoft Teams. All this and more. I'm Adam Kogan. Let's get into it. G'day team, Adam Kogan here for uh, the May 2023 Tech News. And uh, I'm off to Oslo in a couple of days to do NDC there. All very excited. But tonight we have William Leenberg and he's going to be speaking um, on unleashing the power of microservices with Dapper and Azure container apps. Now, uh, William Lieb Liebenberg, he is the man who uh, architects a lot of the microservices here. He's a big DevOps guy, serverless guy, and he is uh, going to be talking about why he thinks Dapper helps a lot with microservice solutions. And he's all he, he will talk about how the maintainability is enhanced, and he will take you through an end-to-end -end, um, uh, example of how uh, you can deploy this with GitHub to Azure as well. So that should be good. He's down in Melbourne, so I'll be handing over to him very sh oh. shortly. Uh, you can deploy this with GitHub to Azure as well. So that should be good. All right. So uh, let's talk about the first piece of news, and that, that was um, leveling up your game with uh, GPT prompt engineering. Now, we're all talking about prompt engineering because uh, a lot of our jobs are going to disappear. We're all going to become prompt engineers. And Microsoft have got this over their site where it's talking about, hey, you structure your prompt. Hopefully, you're all doing this. Well, you understand there's context and a task. So for example, uh, here is the context. You know, This is the paragraph of text. And I want you to summarize this because I don't understand it. Make it a second grade student. And uh, you, you know, obviously, it gets a lot more than this. There's a whole lot of tips on their site about how to do this and some programming bits. Now, I should say, we also have some of that at SSW. We have a rule about the fundamentals of prompt engineering goes on and on. But you will notice that we have a cheat sheet here. Uh, this cheat sheet we, we have in every bathroom here at SSW, uh, this little one. Uh, it's uh, basically gets you up and running. So, you know, give it a roll. Make sure you use these do's and don'ts. Uh, chain your prompts. And, you know, put it all together and you've got a super prompt. Okay, that's just our own lingo here. Now, developers, they need more than that. And so we have a dev edition. And this is about writing code and debugging code and how to understand code. And there's lots of little examples. How you can document code. You know, writing readmes manually is the thing of the past. Uh, refactoring code, uh, code reviews, and some tips and tricks. All very cool. So you're welcome to go and get that. Uh, there, there is the URL if you want to get it. So the big news, BARD. BARD got released by Google. All right. So we now have that. It's a very nice first impression. Looks good. I can tell you it's probably worse than ChatGPT in every way that I've experienced. Uh, there is something here in their uh, advertising which I really like. You can actually pass it um, a question with a picture. So write me a funny caption about this, you know, these dogs, or about this photo. And that's that's one thing that ChatGPT can't do. So that should be quite nice. Now, one of the problems with ChatGPT and um, Bard is it's based on two-year-old data. It's old data, but now ChatGPT and I should mention Bard can connect to the internet. So, you know, there, there talks here about that you could ask it now. Can you tell me who won the Oscars this year? And it will be able to answer it. You can expand this little thing and it will tell you where it's going to find this info. So that makes it um, more approachable by most people. There is a video here. This video here, um, yeah, this guy just goes through it, just, um, just a YouTube video, which is decent. Uh, he just explains how this has all been improved with this extension. So let's 
come in here and talk about it. By default, you're on 3.5. I think hopefully almost all of you are on four now because it's much better. Now, what you need to do to make this feature work is you need to come in here. You click on settings. See the bottom left, these little, little dots, settings. Come over to beta features and then click on web browsing. Once you do that, then when you ask a question, you've got to switch over to the here and then you've got to do this little thing. This, this UI is not the greatest. You've got to come down here and then tick that on. And then it disappears. And then you've got to check that it was ticked on. There it is. <laughs> okay. So let's just say you had a long page, like a big long page like this. And, you know, it's got a million different services here. And you don't want to read all this. You want to get a, let's just say you're reading a New York Times article. And it's a really long article. And you know everyone else in the meetings read it. You can come in here and quickly type, summarize this for me. Uh, now, this obviously is the old one. See where it says 3.5? If you were to change this, and I don't think this works uh, the way I would love it to, you'd go into a new chat here, you'd switch to four, you then have to do the little magic of, let me just refresh that. We switch to four, and uh, where's that little thing? I'll just try. And you will see, uh, it's sorry, but it can't summarize that page. So uh, a little bit uh, disappointing there, but I could say in this, like, all right, I could say change that to summarize SSW's training. That, that would do, end up doing the same thing. And it will it will use oh that won't work either. So great feature, um, but I'm sure it will it will come back. Now that's because I'm using URLs, um, and that's uh, I feel. Let's see this. It's it's not actually using the most. Let me just check. I've got this turned on. See, it turned off somehow. All right, let's let's do this again. Forget what I just did. Let's go new chat. I'm going to go to four. Now I have to do this little trick. Turn that on. Now I have to say, uh, summarize that page. And it will not work in, in the way that I would love it to, but it will say it's browsing the web. I can click this little drop down and you'll see what's happening underneath. What, what link is it going to, to to do this? And this will go off and do this. It'll take a little while, so I'm going to, uh, and, it, and it's sorry, didn't do it. Now let's try something else. You know how we know Italy uh, band GPT. Let's go and ask this question. Now, I better check. This is on. Did Italy ban chat GPT? Now, usually it would say, I don't know, but now it should be able to work out. Um, yeah, it did get banned uh, in 2023. It was banned. If it's very clever, it will say it just they've just uh, stopped the ban and it was only temporary. And Again, I'm having no luck with this. I will come back and see what it gets. I'll try the same thing in um, Bard, see if that's any better. Now, these type of thing, I've had more success with Bard, so let's let's see. This is one of the few areas that it is uh, seems stronger at. Oh, look, it finished browsing. It's given me the right answer. Yes, Italy has recently become... The first one to ban it. Let's hope it says, and it was only temporary. It it would give you the impression that there's still a ban, which is not incorrect, which is incorrect. Sorry, because it's they're they're taken off the ban. So I should have said. Be brief. That's one of the key tips. These answers often are very long. Okay, I'll come back to this and I'm going to... Okay, I'm still getting an answer here. And I think that's the end of it. All right. Cool, cool, cool. So uh, let's, I seem to be 
completely stuck. And I don't have anything. So uh, if that's the case, um, all out of luck here. That is a bugger. Let me just see if I can do anything to get that com to come back. I cannot. All right. Well, I will um, tell you the last piece of uh, news that I thought was uh, a little bit of fun. Uh, in... In a meeting today, we now have teams with these new animations. And these animations are kind of fun. I told, um, <laughs> I was talking to Brady and Luke, and I told them to turn it on. Uh, you go up to uh, the menu under more, and you turn these things on. Uh, now, the way I, I had a uh, polar bear hugging me, the way you do it is you go more, video effects, and then you come down and you click on Snapchat, and you turn it on. At least uh, we were all laughing for a, for a minute. So it uh, turns a business meeting into a little bit of fun. So that's, uh, that's good. All right. So uh, hopefully that was um, good. I didn't get to show you all the news. Never mind for that. But uh, I will hand it over to uh, William Leenberg and I will see you for the tech news in the next one. Hey, thank you, Adam. That's a good bit of tech news there. Hopefully, uh, my demo goes better than yours tonight. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to the uh, uh, May.net user group here in Melbourne. Um, so tonight, uh, we've got a good, good show in store for you, uh, a lot of demos. So uh, let's get cracking. But first, um, I have a uh, QR code here that if you scan that, uh, you can install our rewards app. And uh, you can get some points, you know, win some swag. Uh, it's a yeah, good bit of fun. And you can compete with your friends. So uh, you can see who climbs up the leaderboard. Every time you, you come to an event or uh, talk to one of us, you can get our personal code and get some more, more points. And uh, yeah, if you get to the top of the leaderboard, uh, there might be a surprise in store for you. So I'll give you a sec to, to grab that. And a few people's already got it. Cool. Okay. So tonight, I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, Unleashing the power of microservices with Dapper and Azure Container Apps. Now, my name is William. I'm a solution architect here at SSW. You can find me on Twitter uh, just for a bit of fun chat. I have a blog called azuregems.io. Uh, so now and then I might put something up there, but uh, I think after this, I've uh, got a big write-up to do about ACA and Dapper. Uh, if you want to engage me a little bit more formally, you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Um, now, I started coding a long time ago, uh, I was about five years old, I think, and my first app was written with BASIC on a Spectre Video 328. You know, there you go. Someone knows what that is. <laughs> um, so then a long time later, I, I started uh, a real job with uh, doing 3D uh, graphics programming, you know, real-time 3D stuff with uh, virtual reality, Oculus Rift, that kind of stuff, uh, more of an industrial setting to make sure people uh, train themselves to, to work safely in, in dangerous situations, to, to not hurt themselves or to kill anyone. Uh, it's good fun, uh, hardcore. But then uh, .NET came around and I skipped version one. I thought it was kind of weird, uh, crazy thing coming out of Microsoft. Uh, V2 landed. I was hooked. I have been on it pretty much every day since. I've built most of my career on, on .NET. Uh, so you know, good to say I'm quite happy. And we'll see a lot of .NET tonight as well. Then uh, same with Azure, I've been on that since 2014. And most days I could do play with uh, all sort of the, the things you see on the screen there uh, and more. So uh, this is uh, definitely my happy place. So we know microservices are painful, right? We've heard, heard the news recently, you know, what happens and it can be expensive and, you know, all sorts of problems. Now, these are just some of the things you have to consider uh, with dealing with microservices. 
before you even get to write any of your business uh, logic or your application code, right? You have to make sure they're resilient. You know, look at trying not to make them too complex and how services can talk to each other or discover and so forth. You know, the costs, everything. You need to consider all of this. You know, it's easy for a monolith to do all this. Well, not that easy. When you then go and do it with microservices, each service that you add just compounds the effect of all of these things. It becomes increasingly hard to deal with microservices. So they are painful. All right. Now, tonight, uh, I'm going to try and focus on just four of these things, uh, not all of those, but uh, Dapper and ACA pretty much uh, helps us solve something in each of these categories, which is great. Okay. So I'm going to start. I'm going to discuss with you quickly what is or what are Azure Container Apps, what is Dapper. I'll show you how we can do some development with it, um, how you put the two together, yeah, ACA and Dapper, and we've got some cool live demos. So Azure Container Apps, uh, it's a new flexible container app environment, you know, specifically for running containerized applications. It's different to app services, um, it, more tuned towards running uh, your code directly on the app service rather than in a container. They also, the app services don't scale anywhere near in the same way that uh, container apps can scale. And the reason is ACA is built on top of Kubernetes, but you don't have to use Kubernetes. You don't get involved with it. And this is the nice thing about ACA. All the hard work has been done for you already. Uh, we get serverless scaling from zero to n. So, you know, most people would say serverless means it has to go down to zero, and I agree. Um, now, this this means even the, because it's containers, it's any sort of thing that you can run in a Linux container, you can run in ACA, and can be serverless and automatically scale up to whatever level you want with a whole lot of cool metrics using Keda, which is the the Kubernetes event driven auto scaler. Um, but you know, and it's it's quite straightforward to tune that, and it can look at a huge variety of things to help you scale your application you know, at the right time, scale it out just far enough, not too wide, not too high, all those kind of cool things. Uh, so we've got Envoy for some really cool advanced routing that's uh, um, part of uh, ACA, and you know, we're going to use some of that tonight, as well as the best thing is it comes with managed Dapper. So it's the easiest way to run Dapper and the sidecars that you need uh, in an environment where they basically take care of everything. You then just focus on the applications that you want to write, not the infrastructure or any of the stuff underneath. That's all done. Uh, which I just said, yeah, and all our apps, they, they, they get to run in a, a VNet boundary. They're all there in one environment. They all get to talk to each other, and we can choose whether we want some endpoints to be, to be public or to be secure or private. Okay? It's straightforward. Uh, a really nice feature of ACA as well is that we get to work with revisions. Uh, that means we can, and, and there's different modes. So there's a single mode and multiple mode. Um, the single mode still gives us zero downtime deployments. So it'll just temporarily spin up the second container when we deploy. And when it's ready, it'll swap the, um, the, the containers around. So the new one becomes the active one and uh, the old one just sort of goes away. Uh, in multi-mode, you can actually go and do all this cool sort of uh, traffic splitting or blue-green and other types of deployments. Um, you know, so a lot of options there. They're yeah, quite flexible. And that's not it. There's actually a whole lot of more stuff. But uh, for me, these are the, the top bunch of features. So I just want to quickly go and show you in the Azure portal uh, what the container apps look like. Okay. So I'm going to find my mouse. That's weird. All right. So here I have a resource group that's already got a bunch of stuff in there for tonight's demos. So I've got a service bar, so I've got a log analytics, log analytics, bit of a tongue twister, key vault, um, the container registry where my apps go into. And then most importantly, here's the container app environment. And then all my little apps, or microservices, they all live within that environment. And then here's a few other little bits as well. Okay, so in the CA environment, <clears throat> You see some basic details, and it's got a static IP and so forth. Um, and you know we can go and see what Dapper components we've added, and I'll go through what they mean uh, later. You know, just some standard uh, DNS stuff, and we can see the apps that are currently running in that environment, and we can navigate to them, and uh, just some logging stuff. 
cool. So let's pick some app here. I'm going to pick the first one. It's the Cart API. And uh, this is running on a, uh, these are all Linux applications running on a container. And it has um, got a URL. But you'll notice this one says internal. It's a bit hard for me to get there. There you go. It's an internal one. So it's a private URL. If I hit that, I can't actually get to it. It's not there. Well, it's as if it's not there. All right? It doesn't work. Cool. Um, oh, let me just go back to where I was. Um, and then, you know, we can monitor them. There's some uh, telemetry, the usual stuff, authentication. So you can actually use the easy auth stuff in Azure to authenticate your endpoints uh, or secure them. Uh, you can manage secrets, the ingress. So here's where we can choose what sort of uh, access our apps have to each other uh, and to the internet and, you know, what port and protocol we want to use, et cetera. Pretty cool. Um, again, there's some more dapper stuff. And but most important here is the revisions. Let me see. Uh, I didn't any, edit anything. Thank you. Okay, sure. Thinks I did. Um, <laughs> so currently there's only one revision running. That's fine. That's as expected. I'll show you later when we deploy how uh, you get another one there. When we get to the containers, this is where we can see which container registry is running from, and which image I'm using. And of course, we like using long, crazy numbers for things. But I can also see the um, sort of resources that I've allocated to this. And yeah, I can run half a CPU. So literally, uh, I always see someone or imagine someone having two pieces of CPUs in their hands. I don't know why. Uh, yeah, environment variables, all the stuff that you want to add in, health probes for readiness checks, etc. Um, and then with the scaling, we, you know, we can't talk microservices without scaling. Uh, so I've just got a basic setup right now. But what we could do is if we actually wanted to, I could edit this and say, uh, hang on, that's in the wrong spot. Go here, the next blade. So I can actually say, go down to zero. I want it to be completely serverless and deal with cold starts and so forth. Or, well, actually, they've increased this. This used to be only 30. How am I going to get 300 instances of a shopping cart running? That is awesome. OK, I love it. Uh, or I also have the minimum uh, set of services servers running for um, my app. So that's awesome. They must have just changed this uh, very, very recently. Uh, OK, cool. Get ready to spend a lot of money. Um, Okay, and then we can add those scaling rules. And this is where, you know, we can look at the stuff from, from Kida. Uh, you know, it, you have to look up the, the schemas for things and map them into here. But, yeah, we'll get to some of that later. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to save any of this. Thank you. Go back here. All right. And, um, yeah, so we'll probably spend a bit of time in here. And logs, you know, it's usually quite useful to just go into the log stream and you can see if the app is running and it's the usual console output. All right. Nice. So let's go back. So now you know, you've seen, uh, actually, I'll show you a live one. Just, it's not smoke and mirrors, okay? So um, here is uh, my gateway API that is open to the public. So it's got a, a public in ingress. Of course, nothing on the root there, but I have one of the uh, usual Swagger docs open. And here's all the endpoints that, are, that it exposes from my microservices. Okay, so it is working. You can see it's got this crazy URL there. And uh, while you're sitting there, how about I open up the URL to this. You should be able to grab this and you can go and try to spam my awesome little dapper shop. All right, oh, everyone's giving it a go. <laughs> cool, <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. All right. Okay, everybody good? You can access that, yeah? Cool. All right, well, how about I'll give you the first step. Go down to users and register yourself. I don't know, doing it on a phone might be a little bit uh, annoying, but you'll have a bit of time, right? So let's zoom that in. So yeah, give yourself a username, a real email if you want to actually receive something later. Uh, display name, keep it clean. And then uh, the profile URL, that doesn't matter at the moment. You can do anything there. Okay, so there is an app. It's working. You can use it. And uh, we'll, see, we'll see what's in there a bit later. All right. And now we know what container apps are. 
And the next thing is, what is DAPA? Has anyone actually used DAPA before? I don't know one guy's interested in DAPA already. All right, so it's an open source project. It's part of the, uh, originally started in Microsoft. Now it's part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, it is an event-driven portable runtime for building microservices. It's not the ORM that a lot of people think of DAPA. Completely different. Um, now, it says microservices, but you can 100% use this for any type of service, okay? Uh, the, the, the building blocks and the, the things that comes with it, it can work in a lot of scenarios. So don't worry that it says just microservices, okay? Now, DAPA is platform agnostic. It can run anywhere on your local machine, you can run it in a VM, you can run it in Kubernetes, uh, in ACA that we just saw, uh, and you can run it in, in any of the clouds, all right? So uh, it, it's, yeah, it run anywhere. That's good. It's also multilingual. There's an SDK for all our favorite ranked languages, you know, .NET, C++. You can even use PHP. So I don't know how someone decided they're going to put Dapper onto PHP and, you know, supercharge these also, uh, WordPress sites, but, hey, you can do it. So uh, we'll see. And when we're talking about Dapper, you know, we hear a lot of people saying building blocks. What are they? Um, there's sort of like abstractions, little APIs there that uh, make our life a lot easier. You know, they already solve problems for us and uh, given us an easy way to, to deal with them. Okay? And you also hear a lot of, uh, about sidecar architecture. And it's a, it's a process that sort of runs next to your application. Sometimes you can run it in your application. But uh, in Dapper's build, it's a separate application that works with your application. So just like the little sidecar scooter there. And we'll see more of this as well. Building blocks address common challenges with codified best practices. So they've taken some of these issues that we commonly deal with, you know, a lot of those ones from the, the list at the start, and they've implemented the best practice to, to solve them. So they're all callable APIs, and they can be called via HTTP or gRPC. And gRPC is pretty cool. It's very compact and fast format, so uh, you can squeeze a lot of performance out of your systems. So when you think of building blocks, one of them could be service-to-service -service communication, right? So you've got a lot of little microservices out there. They're going to have to talk to each other at some point. Um, you know, so definitely over HTTP or gRPC, and uh, that's hard, you know? Having to not tell each service where the other service is, what their address is, and how to get there, that's hard. And it's annoying, right? Um, Dapper has a cool way of helping with that. Uh, we'll see how that works. State management. So if you think about uh, key value pairs, uh, we have a lot of state we want to store in our applications. And we can even then make stateful microservices. We can have state that tracks across multiple services, not just in one. All right, and because it's the sort of distributed state, it doesn't matter if our microservices scale out or not. That state's still available; it still works. Uh, PubSub. So that's a, another way that we can use, uh, or a technique we can use to decouple our services. So instead of doing service to service, we can do PubSub. We can send a message, we can uh, put it on a queue or in a topic, and whoever's interested, they can then pick that off and do something with it. So that's a bit more event-driven uh, type architectures that we deal with. And when you think of Azure Service Bus, uh, Kafka, Rabbit, RabbitMQ, uh, MQTT, there's quite a lot of uh, things out there that we can use for messaging. And bindings, now, this is a, something quite special. Um, it lets us abstract our services even further. So we can actually have a binding into something like SendGrid or signal R, or you can write your own one, and it can run in a sidecar and not in my application. My application is going to be very much just business logic or application logic, nothing to do with infrastructure or even configuration. And we'll see what that looks like. It's pretty cool. And actually, there's a lot more building blocks like this. There's, there's you know, not just the service-to-service -service or state management, uh, pub sub, actors, observability, a way to manage with secrets and share secrets around, um, the way you configure um, Dapper and other applications, uh, distributed locks, that's kind of cool, uh, yeah, because we have distributed state or uh, systems, uh, sometimes we need to lock, have a lock there to, to guard against something from happening. 
uh, it's quite useful. And then workflows, which if you've done, say, um, Azure Durable Functions, this is very much the same thing. The API is almost exactly the same too. So uh, we can then pull this straight into a uh, ASP.NET application. It's really awesome. Um, cool. So in a different view, we can see here we've got our application on the one side, have a little dapper sidecar, and it's a dapper sidecar that then connects to these building blocks for us. And you look at, say, the state store uh, with a lot of logos in there. It's not all of them. There's actually a lot more. Uh, but, you know, we can actually start with Cosmos DB and eventually end up in Redis. If we decide to swap our infrastructure, we can do that. But we don't have to change any of the code in our application. All right, I'll show you that for real, how we actually do that. And the same, for instance, with the um, uh, PubSub brokers. We can start with Azure Service Bus, but you know, later on we can use RabbitMQ or you know, whatever, uh, Kafka, whatever it is. There's a lot of choice. All right. So um, now, what is the sidecar? What does it actually do? Well, like I said, it's the building blocks are callable APIs. So in this instance, I've got an application on the left running on localhost, port 80 or whatever, and it needs to talk to the sidecar. So my default is going to be port 3500, and uh, we call the invoke. So that's all the service-to-service -service invocation. It can talk to one of the other um, applications in the sort of uh, DAPA network. And the two sidecars would talk to each other securely. They know who's who with the sort of uh, application ID, which we'll see in a minute. And it will make sure it finds the right service. It knows um, where to find application A and application B. And the communication is routed from app A to its sidecar, to the sidecar of app B into application B. All right. Same with state. You know, if we need to retrieve state from a storage account or Redis, uh, we can do that with just a HTTP call. Quite nice. Now, these components, we have to describe them. Unfortunately, we have to use YAML, but that's okay because they're not that complicated either. They don't actually get that big, which is nice. All right. So, on the one side, I have a state store that uses Redis. And all we have to do is say that it is a um, see if my little pointer works. Nope. All right. All we have to do is to say that it's a uh, state of type Redis. We give it a host name and a password, and that's it. Now, we've got a few other small optional things we can add later, but uh, we can then swap that later if we decide, hey, we don't want to use Redis for our state store. We want to use Cosmos DB. We can do that as well. Uh, all we have to do is change the, the type under the spec give it a URL, a key, and a couple other things to say, you know, which database and which collection to use. And that's all we have to do. Our application doesn't care. It just, you know, I'll show you in a sec what the uh, application does. is just call an interface, and Dapper takes care of the rest. Yeah? So I'm going to jump over to Visual Studio. And everybody can see that. Is that big enough? A bit more? Yeah. All right. All right. All right. So... Got a bunch of uh, microservices in here. Um, you know, we can start off our applications by adding the Dapper client. It's the first line we need. And we don't really need much in our apps anymore, right? All we need is to add a couple of Dapper NuGet packages. And I complicated things by adding app insights as well. But uh, you know, this is really all we need to write up a microservice. Uh, so we add Dapper Client. I've added in some of my own custom services and uh, setting up a bit of swagger. You know, I'm also adding the um, uh, a method here to sub map the subscribe handler. So this is for my application to listen for incoming messages from a bus. And uh, then also at the end here, I s went and set up a bunch of uh, minimal minimal endpoints. So uh, you know, so I can call my my application. So uh, everyone familiar with minimal endpoints versus controllers? Yep, cool. Um, now, uh, just a, a standard get endpoint for a username, get their cart, uh, and you know, I'm just sort of trying to keep this nice and simple. Uh, I can uh, post items into my cart, so you know, add to the shopping cart, and then I can submit my, my cart or, or check out and do that as well. So it's all quite simple. I've also, just, just for demonstration purposes, went and added uh, some more endpoints listening to events. 
but this is just a standard endpoint or you know even with the controller actions the magic comes here with uh, with topic uh, if i'm using a controller action there'll be an attribute on top of that with topic and it says on this service bus uh, or this sort of pub sub component listen to this topic and those messages will get added to my application or sent to my application by the sidecar and all i just handle it as if it's a normal api call all right um, so this was quite straightforward it just uh, logs it out uh, same with all the other ones um, so what i want to show you once i go and add an item to my shopping cart okay uh, i've got a username i've got a product id a few things there or quantity and um, there's a bit of a process here that I follow, but what I want to really show you is um, here, add item. Oh, I added to the list, uh, the wrong thing. Here, save state. So I have the Dapper client, and all I want to do is save state. I tell it into which store I want it to save it in, and uh, what key to use. So it's key value pairs that I use. So if you imagine, uh, remember earlier, I was talking about state, like Redis, key value pair. It doesn't have to be Redis, it could be Cosmos, it could be SQL Server, uh, or Postgres, there's a whole bunch of the options there. And then the sort of value. So here's the key of username, I wanna store the cart for that user in the store. And that's it, quite simple. And then I wanna publish an event as well, saying that someone, or this person, added this product to their cart. So I actually can publish this message onto the bus, and anyone who wants to react to that, they will receive that message and deal with it. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to just start this up and show you that this actually works for real. Now, there's a few different ways we can do this. And I have just one of the old school ways to do it. I'm going to run a command file. And it's going to open up a whole lot of console windows for me. And we'll see a lot of logs being pumped out. All right, but those are the dapper logs, as well as... Um, I'll show you later how the application is run. It launches my .NET application. It's cool. All right. And can you see that? Is that big enough? Okay. Um, so if I open this up and I go to API, all right, so this is the gateway that you saw earlier, uh, but running on my local machine. And I can quickly go, but before I do anything, I need to go, uh, and ask a very important question. How do I debug this application? Well, uh, you can't just go in Visual Studio and say F5 debug. That's unfortunately not how this works out of the box. So the old school way is to start it up like I did and then go and uh, why is there only one running? Oh, did I close them? What did I do? Aha, uh -huh. I think I know why. Uh, I stitched myself up. I forgot to start my uh, Cosmos emulator. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'll get to the resiliency stuff a little bit later, show you how to deal with that. So I'm starting up the Cosmos emulator. So that'll be up and running shortly. And um, we can then demo this properly. So what I want to show is when we run the applications, I have to attach to the processes via Visual Studio and then I can debug them, which is pretty cool. All right. Uh, the other ways we can do it is to set up Docker Compose, which is actually, funny enough, a lot more work than setting up that command file that I have. If you were running on Mac or Linux, uh, the VS Code plugin for Dapper, uh, after a fair bit of work and setting up that you can put in there, just like the, the, the Docker Compose, then you can automatically run and attach to the processes. So let's see, is this running? Yep, this is up and running, I think. All right, sweet. So let's do that again. I wasn't keeping an eye on the logs to, to see that Cosmos was down. All right, we'll do this again. Okay. Let's give it a moment to load, and then we'll go here. Just to make sure everything's nice and healthy. Still hasn't started. No, is that because it's waiting for some confirmation somewhere? To troubleshoot this one real quick. Why is it not running? 
Okay, it shows that it's running here. I'm just making sure everything's good. It's all good. No, it's not all good. Let's exit that and try again. I think I have to be on the main screen for to work. Yes. Oh, that's nice. All right, now I have to go a bit brute force, far out. <laughs> mm -hmm. right, maybe it's already closed itself down. All right, let's, let's, he's making me run around. Let's try that again. Yes. Things I've got notifications turned off, it doesn't tell me when it's ready. Let's give it a sec. All right. Oh, oh, oh that looks good. If that pops up, it means that the emulator should be running and my stuff is there. All right, cool. All right. We'll take three. So I can close this one down and I can. Actually, Sorry for that. I'm in the right place. Here we go. All right, this is take three. Starts up all the apps. And if I keep an eye on it, that is looking better. Excellent. OK. Let's do a test. I want to make sure I can get my user details, which should already be there. Okay, good, it's working. <laughs> now I can go back to Visual Studio and do what I intended to do and say, control P. So that's the shortcut to get to it. So here's all the, the processes I'm gonna to attach to those. Awesome. And we can see all the logs on the bottom there. And uh, so I have a breakpoint here, I don't know if it decides to work. I think it's still taking a bit of time to load. Mm, it needs to go solid red for it to work. So I want that to work properly. Let's try that again. It's definitely something happening tonight because uh, <laughs> normally <laughs> this just works first time. Okay. Um, mm, mm, mm. I'll give this a go. I don't think it's going to hit what I actually wanted to do. So uh, I can go and currently see what's in my cart. I'm going to say my name in there, and execute, and no, something's gone wrong. Oh, it's definitely missing one of the services. What happened? Did it not start up? Redis. Oh, all right, more problems. I did restart before this demo. I thought that was a good idea. I won't do that next time because I actually have to make sure Doc Desktop is running. Um, so we need there. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit later why I need Docker Desktop. Let's start again. So this is going to be take four. And it'll be the last take, all right? And then we'll just run it in Azure because it's guaranteed to work there. <laughs> okay. I'm making sure I've got all my car things here. Oh, I'm definitely missing the cart API for some reason. Something's gone wrong. Hmm, okay, okay. Give it a moment to cool down and I will see what happened. Um, take my word for it, when you want to debug, it usually works. I have the issue is something's not starting up right now, but I'll try and fix that shortly. Um, okay, so all I wanted to show you is that there is a very simple API for getting state uh, and saving state and to publish messages. All right, so that's all I have to do. Now, if you look at the, um, the actual Dapper client that we have, uh, you see there's some bulk operations. You can check, do some health checks. Um, you can delete state or scroll. If you want to delete keys, uh, you can get secrets, configuration, and there's some of the workflow stuff, bindings, which I mentioned as well, publishing events, 
uh, some more state stuff and a bit of the workflow things. And that's about it, right? So it's a, not a massive API, but you can actually do quite a lot of, a lot with it. There's all those basic building blocks that we normally normally need in an application, and they're all wrapped up quite nicely. Okay. So let's go back to the slides. And what I wanted to show you was actually how to configure a component for our application. So I'll just quickly go back. So I have a set of components here. So for instance, here's the state store. Uh, so currently I'm running the Cosmos one, uh, pointing to my local emulator instance. And I'm actually using secrets as well. So you don't see what my key is. But uh, the way that works, I can actually have a secret store locally that reads from a file. So that's kind of cool. So I can actually still commit all these things without my secrets going along with it into the repo. Now, here's the Redis pub sub. Okay, I'm using that for uh, sending messages. Now, what I had before, this little startup script, I might as well show you how this works. So there's the Dapper CLI. I'll say Dapper run, and each application has to get an ID, and that's important for the service discovery. So we can actually talk to an application via its ID and not its URL or host name kind of stuff. You know, the, the things that are dynamic. This is static. All right, we can keep that, and uh, Dapper will use that to discover for us where services are. I have to give it a couple of ports. Each app has to run on its own port, especially if you're running things locally, and then you can tell it where to get your components from. Now, the nice thing is I can actually have a second folder of components that might be the one that makes it run in uh, Kubernetes or in a different cloud. You know, so I have the one that's for my local development, and I can have a set of components for running it in Azure. It's quite easy. All I do is change a path when I run it. Quite straightforward. And you can see here the second command is to say .NET run, and it runs the uh, .NET project for me. It's quite verbose here because I didn't want it to make any mistakes um, when I start this up. Uh, so yeah, that's the old school way of doing it. And you can definitely use some of the, the cooler things like Docker Compose um, to, to kickstart these sidecar applications. All right, so we saw what the components look like, how you configure them, and when an application starts up, it knows to talk to the sidecar, and uh, whenever we call those APIs, the sidecar takes care of everything. It's got this spec, it knows how to con connect to those services, and it does the hard work for us. Now, resiliency is, uh, if I configured it properly, it could have shown you there how to use the timeouts, the retries, and circuit breakers, uh, and even the health checks. So it's just uh, you know, something we have to do to keep our services running, especially you know, transient fa faults. You know, we don't want to have to go and turn our services off and back on because something else broke. Uh, <laughs> we want to just to try and try again. And ultimately, we might want it to give up you know, if there's some real tragic failure. Uh, or we can use circuit breakers, which is kind of uh, a really nice way to uh, halt operations for a while, not hammer the downstream service that's struggling, and eventually, you know, we just sort of probe it and say, hey, are you back up and running? If you are, great. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, close the circuit and keep running. Otherwise, I'll stay open. Um, now, you can actually go and look at the documentation for resiliency. And there is quite a lot. This is one of the, the, I think this is probably one of the biggest parts of Dapper in terms of the configuration, right? So there's a, a YAML spec here that you can use to go and, I'll just make that a little bit bigger, um, to define different policies for timeouts, retries, and circuit breakers. It's, there's quite a lot of configuration you have to do. Now, if has anyone ever used Poly before? Yeah, all right. Now you don't have to use poly anymore. <laughs> now you just have configuration. You don't have to write the code. You just configure your resiliency. That's awesome. All right. Now this only applies to this the stuff that you're running with Dapper sidecars, right? If uh, if your application still needs to talk to some other external API that's not uh, in your network or and running a sidecar, then of course you have to deal with the resiliency there. All right. This is not going to solve that problem for you. But uh, you can do it for all sorts of stuff. Uh, the individual components, you can target individual applications, or you can have just general defaults as well. And there's a quite a lot to play with, right? There's a, if you go through and, and look at all this stuff, yeah, you'll be amazed. Uh, but it's pretty cool, right? So if I go back. I don't know why my keyboard's being a bit silly. There we go. All right. So resiliency is one of the big problems that uh, we don't have to solve with our own code anymore. 
uh, yeah, Dapper brings that for us. It's very really cool. And if you want to sort of put it in the picture, we can have a, an application on the, the one side with a Dapper sidecar running. We give it a, a, a resiliency spec. And if anything goes wrong between the, the sort of uh, service to service uh, example on the top, Dapper will take care of the, the timeouts or the retries. You know, these two things, uh, if, if one, one sidecar can't talk to the other sidecar, it'll try its best to stay alive or eventually give up. Uh, same with we can have a spec that instead of service to service, it can be service to component. All right, so if we're trying to talk to our database or a state store, it'll do its best to try and get the message out to it. Uh, and the, the sidecar does that. Our application doesn't do it. For instance, in this one, we want to, in, in, in our application, we want to do save state. That message goes to the sidecar. My application's ready to go and do other stuff now. The sidecar will try and make sure that it actually goes and saves that in Redis. It's pretty cool. All right, now, if you put it in a bigger picture, you look at all the different interactions, the different building blocks that we can have in uh, Dapper, the resiliency can be done everywhere. So this is why I said earlier, it's probably one of the, the biggest parts of Dapper. Um, yeah, you'll definitely be there doing this for a while, but it's it's fairly straightforward. You just have to pick where you want to do it. Now, you don't have to do it for all of these individually. You can set some defaults that apply for everything. So you can keep it simple. Now, bindings. This one is, is quite interesting. Uh, and I thought the whole point of all the Dapper building blocks is to abstract things away. But now when there's a binding that's specifically for something like blob storage or send grid or you know, one of the other ones, I thought, oh, that that doesn't give me quite a lot. It's it's still I'm still talking to SendGrid directly in some way. And uh, when I actually started using this, I realized actually it still reduces the complexity of my application because all I do is I call the sidecar with an operation and a payload. My application doesn't have an actual dependency on SendGrid, for instance. That lives in the sidecar. So uh, if someday I need to reconfigure SendGrid or um, you know, uh, change something on it. I just do it in the sidecar or the, the component configuration. I don't have to change anything in my actual application. All right. And um, we're actually going to build something with SendGrid later. So I'll show you how that works. And like I said, it removes the dependencies from our application. You won't find the blob storage or the SendGrid NuGet package in your application. Cool. Now, uh, this is where we go and get a little bit deeper with the code. But how do you actually get started? All right, so I gave you a little supercharged uh, version there before, but if you went home and started yourself, what do you have to do? First, you have to install the CLI. Uh, so you go and use Winget, because you know, if you're on a Windows box, that works very well, it's quite nice. Um, but otherwise, uh, you can use, um, I think it comes from Brew, or just go and directly uh, call one of their scripts. They've got a lot of examples on the getting started page. Once you have the, the CLI installed, you just call dapper init, and that will go and download some containers uh, onto your machine, so you need Docker desktop. Uh, we won't be, uh, yeah, <laughs> definitely need containers for microservices now, it just makes things work. So uh, that'll get dapper onto your machine, and then you can get started. Now you'll need a project, so we'll create a new .NET, a .NET new web API microservice project, and add a couple of packages, that's the minimum we need, and then we can start running it with the Dapper CLI. So Dapper run. And then you can give it all those uh, custom arguments. Okay. So <laughs> development and debugging is actually a bit annoying on Windows. It's not been foolproof yet. Uh, definitely better on uh, the other platforms. Um, and if you use VS Code, it is really convenient. It does just take a little bit of work to set it up, but and it's good. And Docker Compose will work very well on Windows, especially with Visual Studio. Uh, you have to have set up a uh, service for your application and each of the sidecars for each of the applications. Um, so it's also, again, a bit of work to get it set up, but you know, that'll be a sort of first class thing to run and debug in Visual Studio. Uh, or you can try another project called Dapper Sidekick. The, this will start things in a different way. Uh, where we saw Dapper CLI to run and then run our application, this goes the other way. Our application starts up, and then it starts the Dapper sidecar, right? It's a different way of doing things, uh, but it's quite nice. Uh, just 
again on windows it's not been the best it still has issues with uh, discovering some of the port numbers for me but uh you might have a bit of better luck than than me and as we saw with some of the building blocks service to service there's a, a create invoke http client uh, we'll use that a bit more later we've got publishing events and to receive events we've got with topic get state save state and query state so query state sort of just um, running a very simple filter to read through um, a, a bunch of state items and give back just what you need so with this sort of application that I've built, uh, here is a nice sort of uh, basic UML type diagram. Uh, and uh, the interaction of our users would be, you know, they go to the API gateway, they call the post uh, endpoint for adding an item to the cart, goes to the cart service. The cart service then goes, hey, before I add this thing that William wants, I'm gonna make sure William's an actual customer. So it'll validate William from the user service. And if anything's good, great. Then we'll go and validate this product that we want to add. Does this product actually exist? And you know, if you want to make things more complicated, is there stock or that kind of things? Uh, now, once all the, the validation is done, we can go and add this item into our cart. So we save that cart into our state store. And then at the end, we publish a message to the bus to say, uh, William uh, submitted his, his order or you know, he uh, check, is trying to check out his cart. And uh, then we can receive that event into the order service. And when they, when the order service gets it, we can start processing the uh, the order and eventually ship it off to the user. Okay. Now what we want to do is we're going to extend this application that we have and add another service. You can never have too many microservices, right? Okay. Uh, so with that order completed event that we receive into the um, order service. Mm -hmm. right, we also receive it, um, sorry, the order service, once it's finished processing the order, it will publish another message saying order completed, and then our notification service will receive that. Then we'll have to get the details of the users and the product, generate an email, and send the email out using one of the send grid bindings. All right, sounds simple? All right. So I'll go to my Visual Studio. And uh, we can try and debug once more and see if that helps. I'll we'll just make sure Cosmos is running. And okay, that's running. And Docker desktop is running. Oh, yeah, let me see. Did I use the wrong port? Uh, that one? 379.79 is the one that is running. Yeah, okay. Uh, it should be all good. Maybe it just took a while to start up. All right. So with um, my notification service that I have here, just a basic .NET app again. It's not much to it. It's quite short, only four to five lines long. Uh, where I add Dapper Client, I'm going to have to add my email service. I've got App Insights again, and I have mapped some uh, endpoints here. And currently, this endpoint will receive an order and just spit it out to the console. Right? There's not much to it at all. I want to show you how we want to add SendGrid to it. But just for the sake of uh, saving a bit of time, here's one I cooked up earlier. All right. I'll step you through what I did. So I still receive the event, but now I'm injecting my email service as well as the Dapper client. Okay. So the logic here is I receive the order, but I can't go and just directly query the state of another microservice. And why is that? So this is the cart service. I can't go and get state directly from the order service or the user service, all right? And you'll see the way this works, the items that are stored, oh, is that big enough? Hopefully we can, there we go. So the way these things are stored is that each key or each ID is prefixed with the API, the app ID. Okay, and we can't fiddle with this. The Dapper sidecar knows the app ID that it has, and it will all automatically attach this to the the key when it tries to query this. So if I query in my application uh, that state store, even though it's all the same Cosmos DB, the order ID of one. I can't do that because automatically I'm in the cart, 
all right? Hang on, am I in the cart one? Which one's this one? Notifications, sorry. <laughs> so because I'm in the notifications one, there's not gonna be any notifications uh, pipe one uh, key at all. So I can't get the state from products. How do I do that? Well, now I have to do a service-to-service -service invocation. And this is where I use just a little shortcut feature in the Dapper SDK to create a HTTP client and direct it towards the orders API. Now that's typically all you need, but for some reason they've decided, and I'll show you why, they uh, hard code this to just HTTP. All right, I like to use HTTPS, all right? So I have to go and override that and just manually form that myself, but I still get the, the headers and a couple of bits that they add in there, all right? Now, um, you can you can make this work in your uh, own way, but uh, that's just what I did for this demo. So I'm definitely just calling HTTPS orders API under the covers. It'll be localhost port 7000 something. Doesn't matter. I don't care anymore because Dapper does all this for me. And I can ship this code as is to Azure and it'll work. No, no config needed. So I'm just doing a normal, and this is the standard HTTPS, uh, sorry, HTTP client. Now everything that we're familiar with, we just use that. All right, so get from JSON and I've just got a, um, the route there for query parameter to get the, the order and the username, just a bit of basic defensive checking. Then I generate the body of the email, create a little email object, and then I send the email and say, okay, it's all good. But how did I actually send that email? And if you look in my application, uh, my project file again, there's no send grid in here. All right, there's no send grid uh, nougat at all. But I'm using send grid to, to send this email. So I'm just crafting up a dictionary of fields. And uh, more importantly, I probably should show you the, uh, the spec for the send grid binding. And it was a link I should have clicked earlier. So you can actually go and look at all the, the bindings that are available and the spec for them. And then here is how you describe that component. So you, you can have some uh, default values that you don't have to provide from your, your application or from here, but you know, as long as uh, you get the API key in there because it's required. So you don't need this in your application. So you can see here the bindings of type twilio.sendgrid. Cool. Um, so in my application, I just go and make sure I fill in the fields that are relevant for this email. If I have a CC or a BCC, I add them in. And then I call this invoke binding async. I'm using the um, binding name, which is the name of my component here, send grid. Uh, not very creative, but yeah, you can call it whatever you want. Then I have to give it an operation name. So in this case, there's only one called create, and I have that here. So to send grid, create, and then the email data that I need. So here's the body and here's the metadata. And it'll send that off to the sidecar and the sidecar will connect to send grid and off goes the email. Now, let's test this. Actually, I'll skip the step. I'll test it in, uh, in Azure. We'll make sure everything is running there, okay? So very straightforward. I can actually bind, use bindings by invoke binding. Straightforward, so just one of the other building blocks. Okay. So next up, we can go and combine all this Dapper stuff with Azure container apps. And like I said, they, they're good friends. They really like each other. Um, Dapper is just one of the nicest things to use in there too. So we've, we've got our application. You saw this before. And running it locally, it's all the .NET APIs. And I used a mixer of Redis and Cosmos locally. But when I ship this into Azure, now I'm running on ACA and I've swapped out Redis for Cosmos DB and also swapped out Redis for Service Bus to do the, the pub sub. Cool. I didn't have to recompile or do anything else to my application. It's literally just the, the YAML spec that changes. And so all we have to do is we commit the code from our machine to, from our machine to GitHub. It will run a build there, build a container, send it to Azure Container Registry, and then that'll deploy to our Azure Container apps environment. So how do we do that? So, uh, now, I've already got it deployed and I can go to my notifications API, which is here, and say, I just want to rerun this and make sure that I run 
the right branch, which is this one will update the application to say, hey, you actually should be able to send emails. Uh, we'll check that. I'm in the right branch. Yep, yep. So this all, all this code was committed and I did plan everything correctly and this is just stuff that I did earlier. Okay, don't need that. Cool. So chances of success should be high. So I'm just deploying this out to Azure. And uh, so what we can do is, this is the right one, yep. And I can go back to here and look at the notifications API. And shortly, we might see a second revision of the app showing up here uh, once, once GitHub gets to publish it for us. Now, what I have is a whole lot of bicep. So this is the infrastructure as code, first class citizen for, for Azure. Uh, it's an extension of the old ARM templates, much nicer. So I have a main template here that sort of just spins up all the, the core infrastructure that I need. So my, um, my container app environment, which is here, and uh, you know, log analytics, app insights, Cosmos DB, Key Vault, uh, service bus, okay? And I also then have to set up my Dapper components. Now, earlier you, I showed you that I'm using a bunch of YAML files to do this, right? Now, you can reuse these YAML files in with a small tweak. You can publish them directly using the Azure CLI with, for container apps. But if you're using Bicep, you have to do things a bit differently. But everything that you do here is exactly the same as you did in the YAML file. Uh, it's just you have a little bit more Bicep code around it. So if, let's say I pick this... Um, state store one you can see here um, i've got a secret that i'm referencing uh, i don't want to put the secret directly in the uh, yaml spec but the same url master key database the collection those are all the same fields that we find in my state store here so the url master key database collection okay so it's the same settings it's just in a slightly different flavor and what we can also then do is to, to add scopes and say this component is only available to these particular application IDs. So if I don't want a certain application to have access to a state store or a pub sub or, or key store, I can just deny them access, it's fine. All right, so it's quite straightforward. So there's a fair bit of bicep uh, to look at. Uh, there's also the one for each of the individual container apps that this really not much to it apart from I was currently saying the scale uh, give it access to the container registry to pull the images and then I was saying here most importantly that uh, dapper is enabled uh, on port 80 and that this container app its app ID or for dapper is in this case the cart API same with all the other ones they all have exactly the same app ID all right and then what we do here, so this is the gateway. So I want to actually enable ingress for this uh, gateway. So I can actually call it from a public endpoint. Whereas if I look at, say, my email service, um, that's false. I don't want you guys to call this and spam my, my email sending thing without any sort of validation or anything, right? So uh, in uh, the networking sense, the only application that's exposed publicly is the gateway, everything else is a private service. So you can't hit those endpoints directly, okay? And um, then to keep things simple, uh, from GitHub, I've just got a very straightforward, oh, it's at the bottom, uh, pipe workflow file, if it just wants to go all the way to the left. Uh, so just on push or pull request on the right thing, so um, I don't wanna ship everything all at once, all the time, you know, only if there's a pull request on the, a thing that changed, build and deploy just that thing. Don't, don't ship everything all at once, every single time. And uh, just a bit of basic stuff uh, for getting uh, the app built. But you haven't seen me use a Docker file yet, right? Cool. So with .NET now, you can actually directly build your application into a container using the .NET build, uh, .NET publish CLI. And all you do is to make sure you say use the, the default container profile and then tell it where, which, uh, container registry to go to. So you give it the the, um, the tag and you also give it, sorry here, the, the server name 
and there you go. Now, as long as you've got like a, an AZ uh, ACR login or Docker login, you know, you've authenticated, then you can push to that container. So that's just one line to build a container and send it off to uh, the registry. Then to deploy, uh, to log into Azure, uh, you know, there's obviously various ways of doing it. Um, and then all I do is just to run the CLI. So keep it simple. I don't want to split up and have new bicep files that redeploy the application. I thought I'll keep it simple, use the CLI. So AZ container app update. So I don't want to create a new one. So I want to update the one that's already there. Give it the name for the container app. Tell it which resource group it's in and uh, the name of the container. And then very importantly, so I use this GitHub SHA, right? The, the, the commit hash for, for this um, workflow. So it picks the right image. And that's it. It just goes and oh, we've probably waited too long. We've seen the... Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Where's the Azure window gone? This one. Ah, oh, I think we might have missed the uh, second uh, revision showing up. Oh well. Um, I wonder if I can show you that in another way. Mm. So this is the one six minutes ago. Gee, we've been talking a while. All right. So it should be deployed now. If you go and use the gateway application, all right. So what I'll show you is. Uh, my user, if I make sure that I actually have the right email address in here. Okay, so good, that should come to my work email, great. Um, and I'm gonna make sure I have something in my cart. Empty, okay. Uh, now I have to make sure there's some products in there. So what do I do? So I wanna add something in there. Now I just happen to know what to do here, all right? So uh, give it the, my username. I want a product ID of one, and I just want one of these. All right, good, sending, and, oh, something went down. Hmm, that's awesome. Uh, why would something go down? So now we need to go and debug. So which one? Sorry? Oh, that'll be why. Sorry, I wasn't paying attention. How did I get that wrong? I can't spell my own name. All right. All right, let's try again. Hey, that's better. <laughs> all right. I'm sure, this is working as well. So, all right, I want to now check what's in my cart. Cool. Got one piece of bread. All right, let's see what happens if I add something else. So, I want to add two. I want to add two of whatever two is and say execute. All right. Now, I have a bread of... Piece of bread and two pieces of cheese. Okay, I'm happy. Now I want to go and submit. I want to actually check out. All right, cool. So I want to say William to check out his cart. Right before I do that, let me just get uh, this orders API. I'm going to refresh that. And I might just collapse that a little bit. Okay, so you can see the logs here. So now as soon as I submit this order, fingers crossed, well, here we go. We received an order. It is uh, saving it. So it's uh, progressing the order from uh, new order to order received. So, oh, now it's processing. And I want to actually get to my notifications one here. Refresh this. Make sure this shows a bit of logs. Okay, cool. Because as soon as this one goes to uh, order completed, which it just did. Well, here, received an order, sending an email to William at SSW. All right. Now let's see what happens. Hmm. Will this open on the right screen as well? That's always the big mystery. All right, so it's gone to my, whoop. New Outlook is very different. Now, I know it goes to my junk mail, but here it is. Great, here's my piece of bread and my piece of cheese. I actually forgot to count up the number of uh, pieces of cheese, so this is slightly wrong. There's a small bug, but um, cool. At least I have some bread and some cheese, and I have it in the email to prove it. Cool, that worked, nice. So does anyone else want to try and uh, run this and see if we can generate some traffic? Go and add an uh, item to the cart and uh, push it through. I'll give you some time and we'll come back and look at this a bit later. All right, so now you saw, I can 
build a .NET application you know, from GitHub. The container goes and gets pushed into AUCR or Azure Container Registry. Uh, or you can choose Docker Hub wherever you want, doesn't matter. Uh, and then eventually you're running in Azure Container Apps. Awesome. So that was a live demo. Now, in summary, the cons, all right, the stuff you have to be well aware of. The local dev experience on Windows definitely needs a better work. Uh, it is better than it used to be. Uh, definitely try the other platforms. Uh, if you want WSL, if you want to go on uh, Linux or Mac, they actually work quite well. Uh, there's actually some features on there that aren't available on Windows yet, uh, especially for running up multiple apps. Now, when, when we're using these sort of uh, components, sometimes you might feel that you've lost the, the ability to fully harness one of those services. You're not wrong, but then you can make a conscious decision to go and utilize it fully. You don't need that but in every scenario, okay? Uh, if, you, if you realize there's something unique about SQL Server or Cosmos DB that you need to serve your applications, go for it. This sh shouldn't hold you back, all right? The building blocks are generally awesome solutions, you know, but there will be cases where it won't work, okay? Uh, unfortunately, some of the components uh, available on Dapper are currently still in alpha stage. Um, so they might break or they might go away or might never go any further than alpha. So just keep an eye on the, the status of these components. Uh, there's like 120 of them there. The major ones, they're stable. You know, the ones that we commonly would use, they're great to use, okay? The pros, all the good stuff. So developing these with these building blocks uh, makes dev work easy. You know, we've reduced the complexity. You know, we can focus just on our application most of the time. Um, you know, the logic inside our application. We're not dealing with the complexities of setting up and wiring up something like Service Bus or RabbitMQ into our applications. You know, we don't have to worry about how our application talks to Cosmos DB or Redis. You know, that stuff is gone. And so that just reduces the complexity immensely. Uh, the dependencies so, yeah, goes hand in hand. You know, less NuGets, less code, you know, less headaches. Uh, I, I do really like this. It it's, uh, serves me quite well. And a lot of the sort of cross-cutting concerns, that resiliency stuff, there's, there's other things when it comes to the security in terms of adding uh, OAuth to endpoints. It's configuration. It, it's not stuff that's in my application anymore. Uh, it's really nice. Uh, and again, lots and lots of choices. Now, the cool thing is I can just swap that infrastructure as I like. My application doesn't care. It just keeps running. So microservices, all these things that we have to think of, super painful, but with ACA and Dapper, it's less painful. So, <laughs> you know, if you want all of that code, all of the things that you saw, go to my GitHub repo there, and uh, even the presentation, all the slides, I'll put it all up there for you. And uh, yeah, go and have some fun, write some awesome microservices and, you know, show off what you've done. Thank you very much. Thank you. The, um, here we go. All right, let's see if there are any comments on YouTube. Oh, there are quite a few. Let's. I just have to refresh this thing. <laughs> They're there, but I can't see them. So let's see if this works. All right, re-enter. Okay. Okay. Let's go to comments. Oh wow, there's a lot. Okay, so. Um, people saying hi, looking forward to the talk. There's the URL, cool, cool. Uh, is PHP the best dev language? I don't know I want to answer that question. <laughs> PHP, who are these people? <laughs> um, okay, cool, cool, cool. Matt Wicks is here. Oh, Matt Wicks. Oh, yeah, I better, I better go and have a look and see what he's done. Yeah, we can go and query the state store and see. Uh, why not use Project Tie to start up all the services instead of a batch file? That's a great question. I used to do that. But Project Tie is 
No more, really. It's, it's unmaintained. It's uh, unfortunately not going to be going forward anymore. You, there is an issue in the GitHub that explains that. Uh, if you read a bit wider, then they do want to focus on something like that to start up multiple services and so on. But right now, the focus is to use Docker Compose in Visual Studio, right? Uh, the other option is VS Code, the, the Dapper plugin there. That's great. Uh, just a, a bit of setup work and configuration you have to do to, to make it uh, do what you want. But it works. Uh, it, it works quite well, especially not on Windows. Um, yes, Chris Clement, would be nice if we can press F5 to run all the services from Visual Studio. Yes, Docker Compose is your friend. Uh, give that one a go. Um, yeah, it looks like it's straightforward enough to set up Rider to start up the Dapper service. Yes. Uh, so if you've used Rider, um, oh, I forget exactly what it's called, but there's some launch profiles or something in Rider that you can use to start all the stuff up again. Um, you know, it's just going to be a little bit of legwork to get started, but uh, you probably won't be adding 20 microservices at a time. So if you have to do it one at a time, it won't be too bad. So cool. Um, any questions from uh, my Melbourne audience? Ward? Yeah. So if you if you assign the things to Send Grid. Send Grid. If you want to use Grid, you want to connect to something to do best. You can use a component. It's there. Just connect directly. You can you can definitely use a component that's there. Okay, so I'll rephrase the question. So uh, I used uh, SendGrid to send my emails um, as, as a binding. But if I go look at uh, the list of bindings, I don't just show you the full list. Uh, there's a long list of bindings that you can use. Uh, actually, is it in this? It's actually a bit further down here. So let's go here. Uh, component specs and then bindings. So here is where you can see uh, the name of the binding uh, and you know the status of it as well. So you can see what's in alpha. So there's GraphQL. There's not one specifically for MS Graph, not out of the box. But what you can do, I think uh, there's a link here somewhere. You can go to the components contribution repo and you can write one and share it with everybody else. It's an open source project, right? Like all of this. You know, the Kubernetes, Envoy, Dapper, they're all open source. They, if you want something that's not there, you can go and contribute. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, here's SendGrid, uh, Redis, uh, Alibaba stuff, AWS, Cloudflare. You can use Cloudflare queues. Great. I haven't used them, but they're there. All GCP, all the Azure stuff, uh, and uh, ZB, Kamunda Cloud. Cool. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but it sounds cool. <laughs> You can try, yeah, definitely just give it a go. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Can you write test configurations? Can so the question is can you write test configurations? Can you write functional tests on the sidecars to make sure the sidecar Okay. Honestly, I haven't written a binding or any of the plugins for Dapper myself. I haven't even seen the SDK. I know it's there. <laughs> if it's there's a big repo that you can go and actually look at, right? So here's the GitHub link straight to Dapper, and if we look at the repos there, I'm sure. Uh, so here's the components contribution one. There's one for each of the the SDKs. Now, if you go and have a look, tests. Hey, all right, there's something there. Yeah, end to end, you can definitely have a dig here and see uh, if it suits what you want. It sounds like it does. I would be surprised if it didn't. <laughs> yeah, it would be kind of weird if it didn't, right? Cool. All right. Any other questions? Another one, Ward? If you've got your, it's a bit more of an Azure thing. If you've got your functional company sitting in Azure, are you going to be billed if it's not actually answering the calls? No. Okay, so you're talking a bit. The question is, if I have my container app, which I was using before, yeah, yeah, yeah. running in Azure, waiting, not doing much, will I get built? Yes and no. No is if you've gone at scale down to zero. So it's not running. If it's inactive, there's a there's a reduced rate for the CPU and memory charge, right? Uh, oh, I think it's like a third of the, the full price. I can't exactly remember. But when it's inactive, 
uh, it's a much reduced bill. And then when it's active, you get charged for the uh, it's a, uh, it's gigabyte seconds, I think, whatever the, the CPU and memory charge per second. Okay. So uh, yeah, scale it down to zero. Uh, just to, just so you're aware, with the, the dapper stuff, if you're using the standard CPU memory metrics, if you scale your app down to zero and you call them, they won't wake up. There's no metric to spin your application back up there with that. If you use Keda to message uh, to, to monitor a, a queue length or something else, then you can spin up from zero. Okay, so just be aware, it's just a small quirk there, but it makes total sense once you start working with it. Yeah, so Keda is um, when you add some scaling rules in there to monitor, uh, I might as well show you here. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's Keda.sh. So the Kubernetes event-driven auto scaling. If you look at the scalers that are available, here's all the things you can look at and in some way decide, scale my application out X units, all right? So you can look at blob storage or event hub or um, service bus, whatever, you know, uh, more YAML. <laughs> and then you know, from here, you can um, see you know, after so many messages or something, something, you know, and decide how, to, how much to scale out. All right. Would it be like Azure Function Pricing? It's still consumption based, yes. So, so it's a per second charge. So the Azure Functions pricing and Azure Container Apps pricing oh. are different. I think they're, they're different products, obviously. Yeah. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't have the numbers, but yeah, those are the pages you'll be looking at. Do a good comparison. Uh, yeah, it'd be good to have some feedback which one you think works for you. Um, so someone's got a question online. Is there a way to check the Dapper sidecar running before calling? Ah, oh, good question. Yes, there is. Uh, in the resiliency configuration, um, there's some initialization timeouts and um, a couple of other policies that you can check there to make sure uh, if the sidecar is running. You can also have health checks on the sidecars as well. So if, if anything's monitoring the sidecar, it'll be able to tell you whether the sidecar is healthy or not. Okay, so uh, yes, all that health checking, it is in there. And if you check out the resiliency page, it actually uh, describes it in, the, in there, or at least one of the links off there uh, describes how to do that. Good question, thank you. All right, any more questions? We all good? Oh yeah, one more. So when I'm running all the sidecars on my local machine, does it run all the sidecars locally as well? Yes, 100% it does. Yes. Okay, so the question is uh, in two parts. When I'm running the sidecars locally, also running, running the APIs locally, do the sidecars run locally? Yes, they do. So this dapper run, this starts the sidecar, yeah. all right? And it gives the sidecar this app ID, okay? And it runs on a particular port, and then I tell it which components to use, okay, on my local machine. And then I say .NET run for that particular project. So, that is that components is a folder so dapper goes in great question no, no one has asked us yet that folder contains all the yaml files so dapper would look in that folder and load all of the components so dapper doesn't run bicep directly yeah so going back to the the bicep stuff that i had earlier that is deployed to azure container apps yeah so then it it takes that definition and it starts the component for you in the container app environment. Yeah. And then your container application spins up and it connects to the sidecar that's available for it. So yeah. that's where those app IDs come uh, in handy. We don't leave. You can if, so, so I mentioned earlier that you can reuse those YAML templates from your local machine but not as bicep as you can you can upload them via the Azure CLI uh, for you. Now there's a command, yeah, I'll have to dig it, but it's something like AZ container app, dapper, something, something. 
update. <laughs> there is a you know, fairly long command, but you can actually upload the YAML from your local to Azure. But remember, it's not going to talk to a service on your local machine. Okay, yeah, it's going to need something in Azure that it has access to. Cool. All right, I think that's all for questions. Thank you very much, uh, everybody here in Melbourne and, and online. Uh, it was great. So uh, see you all next month. This is William from SSW signing off. Thank you.